Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day one of the 2018 MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Sam Fetter, and I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan and the student lead on Hockey Analytics on the Fly, presented by Sport Logique. It's my pleasure to introduce this panel's distinguished speakers. From your left, John Cheka is general manager and, direct, and president of hockey operations for the Arizona Coyotes. Chris Snow is director of hockey analysis for the Calgary Flames. Christopher Boucher is director of hockey analytics for Sport Logique. And Dan Bilesma is the former head coach of the Buffalo Sabres and Stanley Cup winning Pittsburgh Penguins. The panel will be moderated by Allison Lucan, who writes for The Athletic. The panel runs 40 minutes with five minutes at the end dedicated to Q&A. We encourage you to participate with us. If you'd like to ask a question, please tweet it using the hashtag on the fly. Questions with the most mentions will be selected by our moderator during the Q&A period. Without any further ado, Allison, over to you. Thanks, Sam, and thank you guys all for coming. Um, if you were paying attention, you may know that the two teams represented on our panel played each other last night. And as a result, I get to say we have a trade to announce. Dan? The analytics of a trade. Grapes and uh, Bud Light, I believe. <laughs> and uh, the result of the game was in favor of the Calgary Flames. So uh, Ekman Larson will be going to the Calgary Flames for a second rounder and a conditional pick. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> Please don't tweet that. <laughs> Um, but seriously, we're really excited to be here. I think that we have such a great panel representing a diverse set of roles within any hockey organization. So I think we're going to be able to talk about some really cool things um, with a lot of different perspectives. And where I wanted to start was exactly on that topic. I wanted to ask you all, how do you, in each of your distinct roles, look at the analytics that you need to do your job when evaluating players and assets within the organization, and then communicate them among the different roles within your group. And Chris, I'll start with you. Well, I, I think the big thing is that there were people, there were scouts, there were front office executives who came before us in this movement. Uh, so primarily what I've tried to do is adapt to them, not make them adapt to me. Um, but one great experience I had was I spent about a year and a half with our coaching staff when Bob Hartley was the head coach. And Bob brought me down and had me as kind of an accessory to the staff. And for a year and a half, I watched how they interacted with players. I watched how they gave meetings. I listened to the language that they spoke in. Um, and since that time, I've tried to, when I deliver information, deliver it in their language. Um, you know, make it, minimize um, confusion and maximize the believability of that. Uh, and, and even now, like before we'll start a season, for example, we do summaries off of every game, I'll sit with our head coach with a whiteboard in the room and go through concepts. And he'll say, well, I can't teach from that concept, so I don't really care to know that uh, coming out of a game. And we'll adapt uh, and find those sequence events and the, the items that are going to be productively utilized, not just something that I feel is going to look good. Yeah, it's a great answer. What I, what I want to know, though, is how does the information flow to Berkey? That's the key. Well, Berkey, yeah. Berkey hides that Harvard degree really well sometimes when he talks about analytically, analytics publicly. Um, but with, with Berkey, like, there's two things. I was there, Berkey showed up, I'm still there. So I think <laughs> that's probably the best thing I can say about that. Uh, but Berkey, Berkey wants to win, and Berkey's comfortable with all aspects uh, being a part of that process. But we've had, some, uh, we've had some interesting moments in meetings, we'll say that. <laughs> From my experience, it's, it's to remember that it's hockey data. It's hockey data, it's hockey first, it's data second. You gotta communicate that in a way that a coach is gonna understand or a, man, or a GM is gonna understand it in hockey terminology using the same concepts that they're, that they're already aware of, but just kind of using the data to fit those, those ideas that they already have and those needs that they already have. John, you're looking at so many different time frames when you're looking at data. What, are your needs different in terms of how you want to see information? Uh, look, my, my philosophy on how information flows is I hire really smart people uh, that have a high intellectual curiosity, and then you know they're craving information. So whether it's our coaching staff, medical staff, scouts, uh, you know, the way we disseminate information, we like to have active learners. So when we do research and we learn something, we like to have meetings and discuss our findings. And uh, yeah, I find that that creates conversation, discussion, and then typically it kind of leaves the analytical sphere um, and just a conversation about building out a team, uh, evaluating players, um, how you're coaching, uh, coaching tactics. So 
it really evolves from there, I'd say. Uh, I'm not one to kind of force information on anybody. I don't think that works. I've tried it. Uh, it's not successful. So uh, like I said, for us, it's a lot about the hiring process, who we're hiring, uh, creating a culture of learning, and uh, kind of going from there. Well, for me, it's great to hear Chris speak and about that and his relationship with the coaching staff and, the, and how they decided what pertinent information was and how they could relay that information, because that's the challenge uh, for me in, in my position is what is appropriate information and how can I disseminate what that is and then how I can I use it towards evaluation of the team and or players and individuals and that's the challenge. Um, certainly uh, been involved with a lot of data and have a hard time disseminating what's the important piece of information and how can I use that to evaluate the team and the players. So um, getting together and being on the same page, talking through that, uh, that data so Chris can understand me and I can understand him and then how we're gonna use that to, to help the players is a challenge. And that um, at different times with different people have been better than others with, with me and sometimes I'd like it to be right now information, I can use it right now in the game um, that hasn't always been um, the, the case and the ability to do that. That's where we're trying to, trying to get to. Dan, I wanted to ask you too, you mentioned communicating it to players. How much is too much for guys with that level of talent with what they're asked to do? Where's the right balance in sharing analytical information and insights with them and, and just letting them play? It would, I think the, the answer would be that every player in this room would be different to that, to that question. Um, there are some players that have an adverse reaction to uh, too much information or their analytics number. Um, you know, they are on the ice, they are doing the eye test on the ice. And uh, maybe because they don't like their analytics, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, some players have an adver adverse reaction to saying, this is what's happening analytically on the ice, and some players are in tune to that. So I think it's in, each individual is probably much different, or different as you deal player to player. So that's a challenge for you to learn what each player needs and wants. You mentioned, too, the timing about immediacy in game, and I wanted to open this up to the group as well, starting with Dan. With what you're asked to do in your role, what is the right timing and what is the right amount of information to do what you're asked? to do, you mentioned yeah. on the bench, in game. It, again, finding the, the, the appropriate information the, or pointed information as to what, how timely it can be is a challenge. In time, game things, um, you know, there's a yearn for statistical information to help you make a decision on the ice. Um, uh, and certain of that is, needs to be, you know, right to that clock right there, but uh, some of, the other analytics as to how players are playing, possession time, relationship with other players on the ice. Um, I don't have a great second to second um, correlation with that information, more of a segment time period with, with players. So it's, you know, three to five games, I think is, has been my experience that it's been appropriate information. If you try to disseminate that in, a, in between periods, you're gonna be uh, losing your hair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dan, who's the best player you've come across? Best player I've come across? To, to share information with that, that craves information. Well, I, I think I said, it, you know, like uh, it's one person for sure, Steve Sullivan, we both know yeah, works for, Dolly, for yeah. you right now. Um, you know, where we were going to enter on the power play, where their penalty kill forced teams to enter on the power play, and what was uh, something that he wanted as, as much as he could and, and got it. So every day he came in for a game, he got all that information. In between periods, if there was something that was trending or going differently, he wanted the information right. And that's probably unique to yeah, um, at the highest Sid. level. How was Sid? Uh, Sid? Sid, I'm just watching Sid right now on TV, like maybe a lot of us are. Like Sid right now is at another level in terms of the information he wants to get. And yeah. I don't know if it's analytically based or if it's just he wants to see, but he's literally watching every one of his moves yeah. on the bench in between shifts. And he was like that um, as, a, as a player when I coached him years ago, but um, 
not every player, like I said, not every player is is particularly like that. When they yeah, that's my experience too. Like, so we have Clayton Keller. We like to call him a hockey genius. I mean, he's spoke to him a couple of days ago. He kind of outlined the entire first round of the draft for me. So <laughs> he knew players in the Finnish Elite League. He knew, um, you know, just wow. kind of a strengths and weaknesses of all the players. He wanted to share that with me. So, you know, a player like him, you can go to him with pretty much anything. Um, he processes it. He implements it. It's pretty amazing. Then there's other players that you just you can't go there. So. John and Chris, for you, what is the right timing compared to the immediacy that Dan has? I would assume there may be some longer chunks that you want to evaluate, and, and how do you like to see that data turn around? Even at this time of year, trade proposals are on the table, people are calling. What's the timing in which you need to see the data that you want to see? Well, I think you need to be aware of when the people in your office, the people in the coaching office are, are ready to listen. When there's a decision to be made, um, you can feel that. We're, we're, we're people, right? I mean, it's no different than my kids, there's a time I can tell they're not ready to listen. And I can tell there's a time when our general manager is ready to listen. Uh, and then it's on, on me to present that information in a really clear and concise way. Uh, and I do that through you know, the right time, through the use of bullet points, through the use of color. Um, even with the coaches, I give them what I think are these you know, beautifully designed reports going into every game and take great care with that. But I think what they really look to are the limited number of bullet points that are you know, the actionable items, actionable items that they can take right potentially uh, to the team. Um, and, and a point I wanted to make, thinking back on that communication of the players, is part of this idea of communicating analytics to the players, which I think I only do when they're looking for it, when they're asking, that's when you know they're ready to listen, is getting them to understand what analytics are and what they aren't. Um, like, analytics aren't attempting more shots than the other team. That's not the game. The idea of the game is not to put the puck on the net and change to pump up your Corsi. Uh, analytics are doing things productively to separate the other team from the puck, to sustain the run of play, uh, to create dangerous offensive plays, to mitigate uh, dangerous offense or def offensive plays against uh, in your defensive end. So I appreciate it when players ask because then, you know, especially if it's maybe in a lunchroom setting, one player asks, he has three or four guys eating with him, and it's an opportunity to maybe leave them with an understanding of this is how we think about and measure uh, and quantify the game. Yeah, I think your question is kind of twofold. One is timing, which Chris kind of touched on. Uh, I think the other is kind of sample size question in a lot of ways. So, uh, and I think it's really fascinating in hockey. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty dynamic sport, obviously, and uh, you know players play 15, 20 minutes a game depending on where they play. So. You know, one of the things that I did when I came in that I was intrigued by was, was just looking at kind of hits and misses in our draft record. We had had some, some good hits and some lots of misses. So I wanted to try to dig into that and understand it at a, at a uh, deeper level. So, um, you know, one of the things that I found is just sample size of draft eligible players is critical. Um, and you could kind of analyze that to try to find, you know, when some of the variance starts to die down and you can actually get a real sense of a player statistically. Um, but it's also, you, know, you get a lot of guys, a lot of scouts, and maybe you come across this, that pride themselves on like, knowing right away. They see a player for a period and they, you know, they feel like they know, they've got them, they've got them pegged. And uh, you know, we just know that there's a lot going on in their lives, there's a lot going on in that game. Um, yeah, the variation can be extremely high in, in how they play and, what, and who they're playing with and uh, who they're playing against and all those types of things. So, you know, I just found that there was a very strong correlation. Of course, it's not a huge takeaway, but it's important to understand and analyze is, you know, our, our, our misses were a lot to do with sample size, and our hits were a lot to do with sample size, too, obviously. So um, then it comes a trade deadline, and now you think you're dealing with professionals, and they got it all figured out, and they're consistent. And, uh, you know, one of the things I argue with my scouts all the time about is, like, once the players had success, and they're playing like you kind of anticipate they could play, it's too late. Um, and then, you know, the guys that are struggling, they don't want, like, now's the time to get them, right? So it comes down to kind of sample size, projection, forecasting, predictive value. And uh, so for me, then, yeah, how, what is the, the sample size? What is the timing of that information? Uh, those are all kind of critical questions to decision making. It's an interesting aspect of the trade. Like, Mr. Shiro's, Worst trade was Billy Guerin in 09. And 
Philly was playing awful with the Islanders. He wasn't doing very well at all. Everyone in the staff said, do not trade for Billy Guerin. And, and Mr. Shiro traded for Billy Guerin in 2009 and a few other trades as well. And, and you know, we know how that one ended. But I remember that distinctively, that he was, I was not playing very well. We, I had watched him a couple games. He was not playing well. Everyone said, don't do the trade. <laughs> and Mr. Shiro did the trade and worked out all right. <laughs> and Chris, from your perspective with all of these points, that's an interesting challenge for you, right, is to find the right way to present the data, respond to a team's needs or an Absolutely. organization's needs. Absolutely. It's, it's really about the circle of communication, right? There has to be a, an interest. John kind of pointed to that. Someone has to, has to want it. Chris, too, pointed to that. Someone has to want the information. And once you start that cycle of communication, you're able to provide what they want through the data. And sometimes you can just do that by, through communications, by just by talking. Um, something as simple as, you know, the ozone possession time. You know, they might just want that. But, but you know, they, they don't know where to get it. They don't know what it means. You can kind of help guide them on that. And a lot of my role is, is yes and. So if they're looking for that, I'll say yes and. So yes and, you can also get information with this kind of information from that and this kind of information. Kind of linking all that stuff together so that they can understand actually what the data that they're, that they're getting. With all the teams you're working with, do you see evolution and thought coming that way too? Sure. Oh, now that I have this, I can ask this question and this question and this question. For sure, it's understanding what, what links to what. Uh, okay, so ozone possession time, what does that link to? What, what helps you create? So it's your, your, it's your controlled entries, it's your, it's your shot recoveries, it's your face-offs, it's your dumping recoveries, it's your forecheck. Those kind of things link that. So once they start to understand that, and you're putting into a hockey, it's hockey terminology to understand that, okay, if I want to increase my zone time or my possession time, these are the things that I need to look at, and then it becomes actionable data from there. And that's really what the, that cycle and that circle of communication provides. Do you find requests coming to you guys yet to say, this is a report that we're gearing towards the front office, this is a report we might gear towards a coaching staff? Is that something? Absolutely, you're absolutely. Saying? The reports that I do are always. It's always based on who the client is. And by client, I mean client within that organization. Mm -hmm. If it's a general manager, it's going to be something specific to them. If it's a coach, it's going to be something specific to them. If it's the video coach looking for information, it's going to be something specific to them. So there's a lot of different ins that we have with different organizations, and it really is just to tailor, that, to tailor what we're giving to that person's role. This is something John just touched on, but I know you and I were talking earlier about kind of for many of us, the next frontier is the amateur yeah. frontier. I mean, we're still just scratching the surface on the NHL level. But it's the wild, wild west yep. at the lower levels of hockey. Talk about what you're seeing there in terms of the data we can get, the opportunities that exist there, how you, what you're seeing happen in that space. Yeah, so it really, I mean, about two years ago, the, the video quality turned the corner for us. And that allowed us to get that data. So now we're able to get that data. And it's the same exact data set that you're seeing with the NHL, exact same information. Uh, same usability, it's all the same data. So there's a consistency going up each level. So that, that provides that information that you're looking for to say, okay, this is what this player is now, this is what he is afterwards, this is what he is in the future. And, this, and so you can kind of build, uh, build that correlation between those things as you're, as you're going along. But that's really just about getting the data, and, and right now we're able to get that data. Sample size is always an issue. You always want as much and as much information as you can. If you're looking at three games in November for a draft eligible player, might not be the best, best thing to do. But if you're looking at a 12-game sample over the course of, or maybe later on in the season, then you're getting a good view of what that player is at the time that you're gonna draft them. So really, there's a lot of factors going into that. But the biggest, the biggest gain is the, is the ability just to get that data. For the rest of you, John touched on this. Just talk about the challenges and your process of looking at talent. The draft is because. tough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, <clears throat> it's gonna take some time for the draft for sure. I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time on it. I think the key of the draft is, uh, you know, like you have a status quo, right? You have kind of what you've currently been doing or what you, you're doing this year. Um, I think everyone's kind of looking for like a leapfrog technology. Everyone wants to, like, we gotta get perfect, right? And if it's not perfect, then we'll just scrap it and we'll stick with what we're doing. I think our kind of philosophy is like we obviously we we miss a lot more than we hit right now. That's just that's everybody. Uh, everybody is. <laughs> so we're instead of you know trying to leapfrog everything, we're just trying to be like here. That's all. You know, I think like, Tampa's done a great job drafting. They still miss. They still got a lot of misses, but you know their hits are very valuable, and they hit more than they miss, or they hit more than other teams. So um, you know it is it is a data problem, but I think. It's, 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 you gotta be careful with it too. Like the application is key and you know, I think there's chances you can overuse it or misuse it as well. Yeah, I, I find the amateur draft to be the most difficult aspect of, of the year to influence with data because I think you know, with the NHL data and the pro side, we've gotten so good with it that 
And our GM will look to me like in the spring and say, hey, the draft, we're going to just dominate this this year, right? <laughs> and giving him that uncomfortable answer of, well, I think we're a little better. Uh, or when he asks about a player saying, I don't know, like being willing to say, I don't know, I think gains credibility. Um, I've tried to push myself to be more and more comfortable with saying that. And for that matter, we get seven picks a year. Uh, this year, John has some of ours. How many do we have, four? Of yours? Yeah, we well, we, we might yeah. hold four altogether. Yeah, he's yeah. got a lot of them. Uh, basically, the players just come this way. Uh, what, what I would really feel uncomfortable doing this year is walking into that room and with our first pick being in the third or fourth round, being adamant about, you know, this player should move to this place on the list. Um, what I've tried to do is just, you know, build an understanding of the draft of our own patterns of behavior, our, our own individual scouts, tendencies, and because because they're a data set, like their ratings, their historical uh, view on players uh, is really useful because we can look at what they have believed and how they tend to approach it, and then kind of fit those players we're talking about in that current year uh, to their own patterns and and just point some of those out. Uh, so I think when you have real outlying players and tendencies. And, and just building a profile of what kind of players are more likely to make it than not, uh, that's how I probably try to help the draft. But amateur draft has to be the toughest thing, and being sure. an amateur scout has got to be, I find it to be impossible to, I mean, the numbers, John, thankfully, has not given you the percentages of what we hit and don't hit on in the, the draft. They're, they're terrible. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. And I find with the, the data now coming to the amateur ranks, it's, one of the hard things about amateurs is comparing players across the globe against each other. So John scouts in Sweden and I scout in Western Canada, and we're trying to compare hockey yeah. players. And I'm doing it with past Western Hockey League players, and he's doing it with what he knows in Sweden. It's extremely difficult to compare those two, and that's a, a very, very difficult challenge for the GM to do across his amateur scouts. And with the data, it's very similar. You're talking yeah, about so. USHL to high school hockey in Minnesota to tier two in, in Sweden and, right. and all around the globe and trying to assimilate that so that there's some form of oh, some ability to say or compare players. It's it's extremely difficult. And yeah, yeah that I think the psychology of those amateur scouts is amazing, right? Like, if, if you can't take failure, that's not the right job for you. <laughs> like, and some of them, they just, it's kind of a self-defense mechanism where they want to be all-knowing and they want to believe that, that they can find all the players and they don't recognize that there's things that are outside of their control. And then some of them are very willing to accept that you know, they're going to be wrong more than they're right and, uh, and they don't actually know. And that's, those are the ones that really crave information because, again, they're just trying to minimize their error, that's all. Uh, and I think that's where data can really help. But I do think if you're not looking at the draft holistically, if you're just kind of analyzing it statistically, you're, you're going to make a significant mistake. I mean, you're projecting humans, right? So yeah. you look at Chris's first round pick, Valimaki's, what, 6'2", 2'15"? Mm -hmm. yeah. Our first round pick is 6'2", 155. Um, you know, and there's a different level of maturity there, um, not just physically, but emotionally. Uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, when we do you, you collect as much information in as much different areas. Some of it's statistical, some of it's qualitative type of information. Um, and that's just going to help you try to make the best decision. But, you know, realistically, you're probably going to be wrong more than you're right still. When you look at that qualitative information, do you still try and standardize it so there's a scale Absolutely. within yeah. the, yeah. Yeah, we talked about that last night a bit about our combine. He stole my sports psychologist, not just I stole his picks. But, <laughs> uh, a lot of the staff from Arizona came to. <laughs> <laughs> The combine stuff too, but yeah, but, but yeah, you, I mean, you have to, you have to do the best you can uh, with the avail available information to you. So, um, it's a huge part of what we do. Like, we wouldn't have picked a player that's 150 pounds if we didn't believe that he was going to be dedicated to doing whatever it took to develop physically and and uh, get to the next level. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a longer road for him too. So then you have to factor in that as well. Like, it, if it's going to take time, he's a first round pick. How is he going to deal with that? How is his agent going to deal with that? How is the family going to deal with that? Uh, what are going to be some of the influencers along the way? Um, yeah, that all goes into our, our decision. I think it's important. One of the other things, if, if I'm sure you've all seen, they're using some chip tracking technology again in the Olympics this year. And of course, the question in the hockey world, we're still nascent compared to some of the other major leagues when it comes to analytics. What are the opportunities and advancements 
you guys foresee or, or want? And John, maybe you can start by talking on that. Yeah, I got a long list. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one of the things I'm doing right now that I find interesting and might be interesting for the group is there's a, there's a company called Performance Phenomics. Um, and what they actually do is they do uh, MRIs of brains. And uh, it started off with concussion studies. And uh, they do work at a Kingston. It's kind of morphed into more about uh, performance analysis. And uh, kind of the simplest way to describe it is they take, uh, you know, they're, they're measuring con connectivity and density of, of someone's brain. And uh, so for myself, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm kind of running on dial-up, right? Like I'm athletically not as gifted as obviously professional athletes. But then you get a Connor McDavid who they've scanned and looked at, and he's running on fiber optics, right? So just, just the way he's built, the way who he is, um, he's processing information, his, you know, proprioception, spatial awareness. He's basically processing at a speed faster than you know, I'm actually moving. So he's, he's anticipating what people are doing faster than they're actually doing it. So it's pretty amazing that way J Johnny Goudreau is a guy that, you know, you'd think would be very high in that type of a scale. So again, it comes back to there's kind of physical attributes and there's things that uh, hockey sense and the player's ability to anticipate and read and react. And they're doing a lot of work on that that I find fascinating. So we're doing some, some research on that. Yeah, I think as, as we begin to understand where every single player is on the ice, uh, you know, I, I first saw that basketball technology about six or seven years ago when I went to visit the Oklahoma City Thunder and just kind of saw those flashing dots of here's where the five players are on each side of the ball, here's the ball. Uh, we can introduce how we, because the game is defended in a more kind of static and set way and I think offensively played that way as well in their sport, we can measure kind of who's the closest to their optimal positioning. Um, you know, who is making a pass to the most open player on his team instead of looking at assists. So that, that's where our game could go. You know, maybe measuring hockey sense by uh, something to that effect of, of okay, who is, who is going to the proper place? Who is, uh, who is reading the play to make a pass to what becomes the most optimal play? But that's gonna take a great deal of time, thought, coding, experimentation, um, and data buildup just to say, okay, this is, this is useful. We've had this for enough years that there's an understanding and a correlation to something useful. Yeah, it's the defensive side of the puck that we're going to get from that kind of positional data. Mm -hmm. uh, simple things like is it you know stacking versus uh, versus you know or boxing out versus uh, versus fronting a shot, things like that. Uh, stacking, whether or not how to come in on the in the offensive zone, defending. A lot of the defensive side of the puck that we're going to learn a lot from that. I think that's kind of in terms of the in terms of the on ice analytics. I think that's kind of the golden uh, the golden ticket. But one of the challenges with that is you sometimes don't know how a coach is asking yeah. his team to play. You know, our previous coach wanted our two defensemen to back off the rush, and he wanted that first forward back to track all the way inside our defensive blue line, even if it was that late and try to kill that play. So in the data, you might have said these defensemen have a big gap. They, uh, they're not reading the play well. Those they things weren't entries. accurate. That was how they were asked to play. You allow entries, yes, for sure. I, I think it's fascinating, because in some aspects, this particular thing, as a coach, we've done instinctively and the eye test we say the player is playing on the outside and what does that mean um, we've shown players where they've been successful in the past by where they you know their shot charts and other things where this is where you've done been successful to to implore them to go to certain areas and do certain things and you know as more information has gotten to us you know we've talked about entries and where we're entering and where these where this person enters the zone a lot, and to have the tracking, just another st step in that to, to show and help a player, this is where you're at, this is where you need to go. Um, when we're playing well, this is what, what it looks like. Yeah. What type of biometric data do you collect in Buffalo? What kind of? Yeah, like you, you had Pagula's unlimited resources. <laughs> Right now. <laughs> one, one of my friends that came from there said, you know, the guy's taking 10 vials of blood before practice. I don't, I don't even know what test that is, but. Yeah, there was, uh, well, in the two years, in the short two years that I was there, we did a lot of different things, yeah. and it changed a little bit as to. Um, did any of that come to you, or was it just? Uh, yeah, again, uh, I would go back to pertinent information and understanding the information and how I can use it, because I did get a lot of information. Yeah, and um, I'm, a, I'm also on the dial-up, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, kind of a, a lot of the information I didn't I didn't use. Yeah, um, 
That's common. That's okay. What's that? Yeah. That's common. That's okay. Yeah. It's, uh, well, I don't know. I said I'm on dial-up. I don't know how much I can <laughs> decipher and disseminate from a, 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 all those numbers, but some of it wasn't for, for me as a coach. It was for the, in, the athlete, the individual, and training, and, and how we were going to treat them off the ice as, as well. But um, we did spend a lot of money, and we did get a lot of uh, information. Again, I'm, whether it was breaking it down into pertinent information for the coach and the, the player, so that was change the practice plans based off. I, the, I you know, in terms of uh, loads, workloads, and players, yes, it did. It did change some decision making based on practice and and it, for the team and for individual players for yeah. sure. Opportunities, John has a long list, which we'll get later. But what are some of the challenges to acceptance of these thoughts? We, we hear all the time players are nervous about thinking about how fast did I skate? How many sprints did I take down the ice? Are there challenges that you each see in your roles? And maybe I'll start at the player level, maybe since you're closest to accepting the use of analytic information. Typically, they don't, they don't like negative information. Yeah. They're nervous about negative information. So if, there's, if the number says they're slow, they don't like it. <laughs> Um, and they're nervous about it, but uh, and that's really truly the answer. If they're slow, they're nervous. Yeah. And if they don't like the split time, then they're nervous mm -hmm. about it, and they don't want to don't want to typically use it. And um, again, the, the valuation of the information for, to the player is probably what makes them a little skittish. How can it be useful to me, and how am I going to use it to get better? Is is when you can do it, bring it to them. Mm -hmm. That way, then you have a chance at them um, in liking the information, yeah. wanting the information. Chris, you know what you can track and interpret. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges you see to taking things to the next level from your perspective? Really, it's for in the communication side. It's really the fear, the fear of uh, the fear on, from the other end of being wrong or being made to look stupid or or be, being made to kind of contradict their opinion or their view on the game, and that's really where it be becomes a way of just saying, okay this is actually going to help you. This is actually going to either fit you or, or fit what you're looking for or not. But it's really just about getting over that fear of information that might make me look stupid or make me look dumb. And that's, that's been the biggest challenge. And once, once there's a bit of a buy-in and you're able to communicate that, and then again, like I said earlier, turn into hockey terminology and make sure that it's understood at the, hockey, at the level of the game, then it always helps kind of the, that communication flow again. I, I see the challenge and, or the, the primary objective as you know, make the scouting group feel both amateur and pro, and I think it's easier on the pro side because we've had better data for longer, that analytics is not an alternative to scouting. Like, these are, these are inextricably linked. Uh, they can help me, I can help them. You know, they can provide context. Uh, I can say, hey, watch these couple of players when you go to the game tonight. They, I don't know them, but they look really good uh, in the way that our information is, is totaling up. Uh, and, and part of that, to be honest, is seeing games and writing reports myself, yeah. to uh, be vulnerable, to have an opinion. And sometimes the opinion I write is in contrast to what the numbers are, are saying. There was a player I saw last year, and the entire year I said, this guy can really defend. He can play against top lines, and he can defend. And then I went to a game, and he got beat wide badly, and his feet didn't look good. And I wrote a report and said, nah. I went from really wanting to kind of moderately wanting him, and then the next time I said, nope, I don't want him. And then regrouped a week later in my office and said, no, no, this guy can do this because those couple of in moments are not the totality of, of his performance. But those reports are forever in our system. And then I have to sort of say, well, I, I said this and I also said this. And I think that those moments of maybe I feel like I failed are actually good for the process. And Chris, you've mentioned too at the macro level the importance of having a champion to just make this part of the culture, part of the way of thinking about yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, 11, 12 years ago, I went to work for the Minnesota Wild, and there wasn't a single person in the league who was doing this kind of work. Um, you know, John's kind of leading off in the sense that he's, he's really the, the first guy to come into the league as an analyst, purely. Um, but obviously, his, his thought process is comprehensive. Like, it's not a model making every decision. Um, but, but at some point, you know, hopefully there will be a champion, somebody who maybe wins a championship uh, with this type of Working approach. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I think it would validate a lot of this. I mean, people, it, it's been exciting to see people get hired uh, to roles of, you know, manager and director of hockey analysis. Um, 
but it's kind of like joining the witness protection program. Like it is the last day you ever hear from those people. <laughs> you don't see them anywhere, they're not on Twitter any longer. Yes. Uh, you check the website and assuming it's up to date, you're like, yep, he's still there. Uh, but really, it, they, they go completely quiet because now they're sort of this component coming in underneath the decision makers. Uh, and ideally, at some point, these people would be the decision makers. Yeah. John, what challenges, <clears throat> excuse me, do you see? Challenges? Um, well, I guess as, as a manager, um, you know, my, my philosophy, I guess, is like, you know, Dan was talking about like, that survival attitude. Like, I, I just, I don't accept, like, I don't have time for it. I mean, if a guy doesn't want to know that he's getting slower, like, I don't think he wants to be of a job either. So <laughs> I, if you don't want information, we're not the right organization for you. Um, that's just how it is. Like, you know, scout doesn't want information, coach doesn't want information, players. I want players that are saying, hey, my game's not good enough. I want to take a proactive approach to this. I don't want to survive, I want to thrive. Um, you know, wh what can I do? What, where is my, like, where, where is my practice loads at? Like, where, what can I do? Where am I at strength-wise? Where, where is my game fundamentally? Sometimes, you know, there are good answers too. You can get some guys that are, are not, they're worried or nervous about their game, and they shouldn't be, right? Because they're doing good things in a lot of good ways, and we're saying, hey, stick with it, keep with it, keep doing the good things, and, and, the, and the results will come. Um, you know, then there's some guys that their game's just kind of gone off the rails and they need to get back on. So, again, they can kind of take that approach of, like, don't tell me, I'll stick my head in the sand. I, I don't think that's how you win. Um, I could be wrong, but our, our culture is yeah, one of information, uh, one of trying to find, uh, you know, iterate on process and, and continue to find that edge and continue to find new ways and evolve in what they're currently trying to do. And if you're not doing that, again, player, medical guy, it doesn't matter, then, then we're just not the right organization. Do you feel that active learning <clears throat> can be developed or is it innate? Um, I certainly <clears throat> hire based off of you know, my discussions with someone and whether I feel like, you know, they are an active learner or a passive learner. Um, but, you know, I, th I think I, what I've learned is through my young career um, that when you get a group of really highly skilled, talented people that, that want to learn and you put them together, it's, uh, it's a powerful thing. And that's just, you know, you see all these teams that, that grow a young core of young players. I think part of it is that they're talented individually and part of it is they push one another. We're seeing that in our team, young group. They train together in the summers. They go to dinners. They watch video together. I mean, we had four guys last night in the power play under the age of 22. <laughs> I'm sure this morning, you know, Rick Tockett is helping. They're, they're, they're sitting in a, in a theater right now. Our power play went 0 for 5, whatever it went, and they're going over their power play together. And that, to me, is uh, how you get better, how you win, how you build something special. Uh, and, but it doesn't happen just on a whim. It doesn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. Well, John and I were talking backstage about how you know, junior teams are now hiring you know, analytics people. Like, that's becoming a process where we, we really haven't gotten players who were exposed to this before the NHL. We'll begin to get players now who have been exposed to this. Yes. So whereas you may have a guy or two who are really high consumers of information and ask, maybe we'll be at six or eight in a few years and then be at most of the team in five years. Awesome. Well, we have time now for some questions from the audience. I'm about to hope that you all submitted quite a few. Um, or I get to ask. Yeah. Does yeah, someone else have any questions while I check this? Do we have any questions from the audience? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe I'll switch iPads, talk amongst yourselves, offer more trades. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right. Let's see. I'll open this to the group. I don't even know who might be best to answer. Uh, what's a specific example of when analytics made you change your mind on a decision? Anyone? Uh, I, I, analytics is never going to change my mind on a, like, it. Like, it's all in conjunction with one another. So, yeah. you know, if I have some some concerns about the character of a player, you know, how he's going to fit with our group culturally or how he's going to play for my coach, whatever it is. And then I get some information back that, you know, there's some, some inconsistencies with how we view his game, with how he grades out statistically, whatever you want to call it. Um, then it, it gives me pause for hesitation, but uh, her cause for hesitation. Um, but I wouldn't say 
you know, if that was the one thing that held me back or, or pushed me forward, you know, in the same way, I'm not making any decisions just based off of that solely either. Because what I've found is, is, I don't know if it's just how it works or I don't know if it's fate or what, but if you don't kind of take a holistic view and you don't look at all the different areas and you're not satisfied with checking all the boxes, it's the ones that you don't look into that end up biting you. And, and those are the ones I regret. You know, when you say change of mind, it indicates a firmness of an opinion. I don't think anybody on this panel really has that firmness of opinion. We're learning, we're learning. So if you have that openness to learning, you're learning from the data. So there's things I've learned from the data, but never something has changed my mind or made me think differently about it because yeah. you have that openness. I've, as a coach for me, I've always kind of feared looking for statistical information, analytical information that validates what I already think mm -hmm. and then disregarding the, one, the information that doesn't. That's a big challenge, but there's been, uh, you know, from numerous things that have shaped and uh, different aspects of my opinion about the game, you know, from zone entries, you know, I think you can think of it from an offensive end, but we play defensive differently, differently because of zone entries and, and the information mm -hmm. I have based on that. And I can look at teams that they have suppressed shots because of this particular information. I don't know if mm -hmm. they, they have the information, but they suppress shots by playing defense this way, limiting zone entries, dropping their shot totals from 25th in the league to now they're in the top five in the league mm -hmm. in shot suppression. So it has helped shape how we've done things as mm -hmm. a coach in, in number of, numerous ways. This might be what you were talking about earlier too of in-game information, but Coaches have such unique perception of the game in game because you're at ice level. You don't, you can't necessarily see everything. Do analytics inform your understanding of a game post game? Maybe based on what you thought you saw, but then you look at the numbers. You, it informs what you understand of how the team played, or maybe no. Uh, that close to the game, it's it's a. I find it to be a hard mm -hmm. correlation to to uh, you know that can. I get a different view of the game during the game, and then I get a different view of the game when I watch the game again um, from, you know, essentially from where John watches the game from, up 200 feet away. It's so, easy up there. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I get different perspective watching the whole game again, um, and I don't always feel good about my complete evaluation of the game until I've seen it from the two different perspectives. Right. So the analytical information is a part of that. Um, sometimes I, again, I feel like I'm, fighting it, fighting the information that is coming, mm -hmm. um, especially when it's such close to the game and in game situations. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Analytically, this is a fun one, whoever submitted this. <laughs> Analytically, how do you synthesize what the Golden Knights have done this year? John, maybe I'll start with you, just watching it from, from your purview. Oh. Um. <laughs> done a great job. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think, uh, again, it goes back to kind of what I was talking about, where I think uh, they build a great team, and a lot, a lot of that has to do just with how motivated they are. I think we were there. We opened on their inaugural game, and uh, I knew from the anthem we had no chance. Uh, I knew <laughs> from <laughs> as soon as Derek England scored, we definitely had no chance. Um, but I, I think there's something to be said about, again, there's, I don't think they have a lot of personalities that are bigger than the team. I think the coach has done a nice job. Um, it's, it's, honestly, it's a lot of the, you know, we're at a statistical conference. It's a lot of the intangibles, and that group's got great chemistry. They work extremely hard. Uh, they like one another. It's clear that they're playing for something more. That's why we had no chance that first game. I mean, they were just playing for something that was much more important than a hockey game. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was a hockey game. Right. On the data side, that's yeah. a team that has a lot of depth, a lot of depth, a lot more depth than people realize, I think. Um, they have 11, there are 11 deep in, in players that can play good minutes and strong minutes. In the back end, too, they have some guys like McNabb, who was kind of undervalued, who's, who's kind of turned the corner, and, Sh and Schmidt, of course. And I'll see goaltending is the, is the great equalizer with them. So I think just or, or we're gonna, uh, they're often, their depth on the front end is a lot, is a lot stronger than I expected uh, when, they, when they came out of the gate. It must be fun for you because even if you're working with one team, you still get to see across yeah. other teams in the league and get insights. Yeah, like well, that. I, I'm I'm up to here with the data every single day, so <laughs> it's it's just something that you that you get and you see. So it's it's the, it's the it's the it's the most fun thing I've ever done and probably the most fun thing I'll ever do. So yeah, absolutely. Chris, thoughts on Vegas? 
Yeah, we didn't play them until about game 40 or 45 or 50, and people had thought they would drop, and then they didn't drop, and then we saw them play. And, um, you know, we gave the coaches all the numbers, but when you see them in person, you realize this team is really fast. Uh, they're really organized. They're all over you. Uh, you know, as John said, it's really clear that every player in that team feels really important, right? They haven't had contractual issues. They haven't had players separate themselves in, you know, ways of performance or, or, or money or anything. Uh, every person there feels just about the best he ever has about himself. You know, maybe a guy like James Neal, who's been on teams like he's been on and achieved what he's been on, um, feels differently about, this is just kind of a, fre a breath, breath of fresh air experience, but there are a lot of players who have gone from being third line players to being second line players. Um, and it was pretty clear to John's point about that opening night and that speech that Derek Anglin gave, you know, Las Vegas became a real city uh, to I think a lot of, 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 of the players there. Like, okay, this is a community, the terrible thing happened here, there's something really to play for and organize around. And uh, when you watch them, it, it's not surprising. All right, well those are the questions we got. Thank you all for participating. I would just like to thank each of you so much for your time and a special thank you, thank you to, of course, SportLogic for sponsoring this panel. Something I'm passionate about, I know that you all are and hopefully you all are as well and you took something away from today and we'll Great. see you soon. Thank you all so much.